This is a reading from the novel Independent Study by Joël Charbonneau, Chapter 8. Hitting the ground knocks the air from my lungs. Struggling to breathe, I roll to my side and peer through the haze of smoke toward the screams coming from behind me. Something is on fire. No, not something, someone. Pushing to my feet, I pull my bags up onto my shoulders and run. My heart pounds with each step. A female shriek for help cuts through the air. As I get closer, I see Raffi batting at flames, streaking up and up his left arm. The girl keeps screaming. Griffin strips off his shirt and uses it to smother the fire as the other boy looks on, immobile, frozen by fear. When I reach him, Raffi is cradling his injured arm close to his body. His jaw is clenched in pain. Griffin's eyes narrow as I pull a towel and a bottle of water out of my bags and ask him to help me clean and bandage the wound. Despite his suspicion, he takes Raffi's uninjured arm and helps ease him to the ground. Using my pocket knife, I cut away the singed fabric of Raffi's sleeve and examine the patch of angry flesh that stretches from just above his wrist to below the elbow. The wound must be painful, but it's not as bad as it could have been. The loose fit of the shirt helped keep the flames far enough from his flesh to prevent blisters or worse. Thomas's brother was once burned when a tractor's engine caught on fire. Those burns looked months, they took months to heal. This will cause Raffi discomfort, but shouldn't slow him down too badly, especially if he keeps the injury clean. I rip the towel into several pieces and wet the first with water. Raffi clenches his teeth as I clean the burn. I start to bandage it when I hear, You should use this first. Enzo holds out a small white tube of anti-infection ointment. He must have packed it in his university bag when they instructed us to be prepared. I'm thankful he did. I spread the cool ointment onto Raffi's arm and see some of the tension leave his shoulders. When I'm done, I hand the tube back to Enzo, wrap the makeshift bandage around Raffi's arm and tie it in place. Raffi touches his injured arm with his right hand and looks up at me. Thanks, you didn't have to come back and help. Yes, I meet Raffi's eyes and then glance at the others in his team. Who are you looking at me who are looking at me with various levels of anxiety, anger, and distrust? Yes, I did. To do any less would be against everything my parents taught me, would dishonor the colony I grew up in. Keep the burn clean, avoid touching it, yellow patches of dirt around here, and you should be fine. We have to get going. Raffi nods, and I follow my teammates back to the wall. As I throw my leg over, I hear him yell, Just so you know, we're still going to beat you at to the end. I can't help but laugh and yell back, You can try, before dropping to the other side. We decide to wait until we reach the exit of the zoo before we open the next clue. When we reach the bridges, we find three small silver skimmers marked with the numbers 1, 2, and 3 waiting for us. Team 4 must have already left for the next part of this induction task. As Will and Damon check out our skimmer, Enzo and I break the seal of the envelope and read aloud. Go to the place where armed vehicles once left the ground for the sky. Your next clue and task wait there for your team to try. The old Air Force base, right Damon? Enzo asks. That'd be my guess, Damon says, opening the front cab of the skimmer. Let's get going. Wait, Will says. We want to be the first team to finish this team challenge, right? You just figured that out? Damon sneers. Anger flashes across Will's face, but his voice is calm when he says, One team is already gone, but the other two haven't reached their skimmers yet. How fast do you think they'd get to the end of this challenge if they had to walk? Damon's mouth spreads into an unpleasant smile. Maybe you're smarter than I gave you credit for. We can start with that one. No. All eyes swing to me. Will's eyes, which normally sparkle with charm, are now filled with calculation. No, we don't need to sabotage other teams to succeed. Will frowns. But if it helps us win... Anyone who has to cheat to win doesn't deserve to be here, and they don't belong on my team either. There's one team ahead of us. I'd rather spend our time catching them than screwing with the teams that are already behind. If you don't agree, you can stay here and do whatever the hell you want. With that, I climb into our skimmer. Out of the corner of my eye, I can see my teammates looking at me with varying degrees of concern or disbelief. Enzo takes a step toward the skimmer, but Damon yells for him to stop. 
that I'm bluffing and I won't leave them behind. He might be right, since leaving my team here on their own will only encourage them to steal a skimmer that belongs to one of the other teams. I just have to hope my threat to leave them behind will make them abandon their thoughts of sabotage. Ignoring the argument taking place outside, I survey the controllers. The skimmer is much like the one my father uses in Five Lakes. Old, with frayed seats, and barely enough room to the cabin to squeeze in four people. I slide behind the controls and hit the start button. It takes two tries before the engine catches hold. When it does, I pull the hover switch and feel the skimmer vibrate as it lifts off the ground. It isn't until I pilot the vehicle forward that my teammates race over. Wait! Will is the first to reach the skimmer. I stop the skimmer, pilot it back to the ground, and open the door and let my teammates inside. Will laughs as he climbs into the seat next to me. You know how to make a point. We'll do it your way and win without interfering with the other teams, all right? That'll make it all the more fun to celebrate when we mop the floor with them. Now, the real question is whether you know how to pilot this thing well enough to race the other team to the next location. While I think I'm capable of piloting the skimmer, I'm glad when Will asks if we can switch positions with me and takes the controls, since I've only driven one a handful of times. See, I knew you wouldn't be able to control this thing, Damon says, sliding into the back seat. Will and Enzo should have listened to me. Instead, they give it to the girl who doesn't understand what it takes to win and overreacts to an idea that's different than her own. When this is all over, I'll have to talk to my father about the lower admittance standards allowed for the colony students. Will's hands tighten on the steering wheel, but he says nothing to defend or condemn my actions. Enzo, too, keeps silent as Will pulls the lever and makes the skimmer hover off the ground. While I don't believe I was wrong to insist we succeed on our own merits, I can't help wondering if those in charge will judge me as Damon does, weak, histrionic, and unable to lead. Damon watches me with a smirk. He's enjoying the doubt he planted in my mind and the minds of my teammates. Determined to prove his words incorrect, I swallow my concern and discuss the location of our next task. The instruction sheet from the upper years says site number two involves aircraft. The clue says the vehicles that soared in the sky are armed. The old United States had several military forces that helped defend the country, land, sea, and air. While I've never heard of the Air Force base Enzo and Damon instruct Will to pilot toward, I've no doubt the destination is the right one. How far do we have to go to get there, Will asks as the skimmer lurches forward. I'm not sure exactly where we are now, but the base is located outside the southeast border of Tosu City, Enzo says. I can tell you where we are. I dig through my bag, pull out the transit communicator, and flip the switch. I read off our current coordinates. According to Enzo and Damon, we are just past the boundary of Tosu City on the northeast side. After some discussion, I plug in our best guess for the coordinates of the base and read out claims the airfield is 11 miles away. Our skimmer is slow, but as long as it doesn't break down and we don't get lost, we should make it there in less than an hour. Hands tight on the control, Will offers none of his unusual banter as he concentrates on steering the skimmer east. Which way? Will asks when we reach the wide road. We can either follow the road we are currently traveling, which angles to the southwest, or go down the hill to a smaller road that heads southeast. To the southwest, I see grass, shriveled trees, and grayish soil an area yet to be revitalized. To the southeast are the outlines of buildings and healthier plant life. According to the readout of the transit communicator, the southeast path is the shortest route, but it might not be the smartest, since it appears to go directly through the city. Navigating the skimmer through streets filled with people and other modes of transportation could take more time than traveling around the outskirts. What do you think, Will? I ask. Why are you asking him? Damon crosses his arms across his chest. Are you scared to make the decision yourself? Will is the one piloting this thing, I say. He should get the final say in the direction we take. Damon looks like he wants to debate the issue, but Will cuts him off. The controls aren't responsive. We can go faster if I'm not worried about crashing into buildings when I have to turn. Okay, I say before Damon can object. Let's go. Using the transit communicator as a guide, Will steers the skimmer to the southwest. Through the window, across from me, I see a river that runs parallel to the road. The water has a green tint, but otherwise runs clear. 
To the left of us, far in the distance, I can see the revitalized center of the city. Closer to the road, perhaps a half a mile away, are collapsed buildings, broken walls, empty city streets. I scan the horizon for signs of people, but find none. Do people live out here? I ask. I'm surprised to see an area so close to the city uninhabited after a hundred years of revitalization. In Five Lakes, my father's team is constantly working to push the boundaries of our revitalized community. With so many people living in Tosu City, I'm surprised they haven't worked harder to repair the land and spread out. Not many, Enzo says. Most of the farms and skimmer factories are located to the north. So the Commonwealth encourages those wanting to leave the city to go in that direction. No one wants to move into unrevitalized areas alone. My parents talked about it once, but there are too many dangers outside the current boundaries of the city. It's safer to stay where we are. I look towards the city and its buildings. Over 100,000 people live in that area. They have power, clean water, and the comfort of being near one another. Few wild animals venture into the streets. No threat of the chemicals that still corrupt the earth beyond the city limits. I can understand why people choose that safety for themselves and their families. There are a few citizens in Five Lakes who prefer living near the square, where there is less chance of animal attacks or being isolated during an emergency, but most of us are spread out. If necessary, we can survive on our own. I wonder how many people in Tosu City could say the same. It is Enzo who first spots the chain-link fence that announces we have reached our destination. The fence stands at least eight feet high and stretches far into the distance on each side. As we get closer, I can read the dirt streak signs posted on it. Danger. This area has not been revitalized. Hazardous material inside. Do not enter. How are we supposed to find the next, next task? Damon asks. This fence goes on for miles. The final years want us to find the task, I reason. They must have made this location obvious. I hope Will steers the skimmer east along the fence line while the rest of us look for signs of the next induction task. There, in the mid-afternoon sunlight, a red flag flutters from the top of the fence a hundred yards away. When we reach the spot and exit the skimmer, four large steel boxes about three feet wide and six feet long are sitting on the ground next to the fence. Each has a keypad embedded into the top. None of the boxes appear to be disturbed. We are the first team to arrive. While Damon pumps his fist into the air, Will throws open the lid of our box. Inside, there is a note that reads, The planes of the past used Newton's laws of motion to reach the skies. Now it is your turn. Choose a team member to climb into the box and close the lid. When the lid locks, the marker and clue to the next task will be dispensed. Solve the problem on the display to release your team member and you'll be on your way. Someone has to get in there, Enzo asks. Will reads the note again and nods. That's what it says. He closes the lid on the steel box and opens it again. There must be a weight mechanism on the bottom that, when it's engaged, activates the lock. Maybe we can fill it with rocks or something heavy enough to simulate a person. I doubt the final years will let us off the hook that easy, but I follow Will's lead and pile several heavy rocks into the box. When the, lo when the lock still won't engage, Enzo frowns. They must have heat sensors set up to ensure that we comply with the guidelines. Either that or we're being watched. Okay, Will nods. Who's going to get in? See ya, Will, Damon says. She's the captain and the smallest. Both good reasons, but the idea of being locked inside of a steel box and reliant on my team to release me makes me want to run far and fast. Damon notices my hesitation and says, You picked this team, Sia. Don't you have enough faith in your judgment to rely on us to solve the task on our own? I look from Damon's smirking face to Will's, with its lack of expression to Enzo's concerned one. All three are smart. They wouldn't be attending the university if they weren't. Do I believe they will come up with the correct answer to whatever problem they are given? Yes. Do I trust them with my life? No. But I don't have a choice. Damon has cornered me. Refusal will alienate my team. Even if we pass induction, I will have made enemies. Okay, I say as I set the green team bag on the ground and climb into the cold steel box. As small as I am, I have to bend my knees to twist my shoulders to fit myself into the container. Why don't you give me your bags, Will offers, and reach for the straps. That'll give me more room. No, 
I pull the bag tight against my chest. While I have been maneuvered into putting my life in my team's hands, I will not trust them with my secrets. The transit communicator will stay locked in this box with me. Here, Enzo puts his flashlight in my hand. We'll get you out of there quick, I promise. As I watch Will reach for the lid, I pull it down. I hope Enzo is right. Metal closes over me. Everything goes black. I hear the snap of the lock and that tells me there is no going back. Until my team comes up with the correct solution, I am trapped. I hit the switch on the flashlight. The small beam reflects off the silver of my prison. Even though I know it's fu- it is futile, I push against the metal above me. It does not budge. I run my fingers along the edge of the lid. The seal of the box appears tight. I click off the flashlight confirms my suspicion. There is no hint of outside light. Unless I am mistaken, this container is airtight. If my team does not release the locking mechanism in a timely manner, I will die. I need to conserve air, but my breath comes fast and harsh. Knowing my life lies in the hands of someone who in the past tried to kill me fills me with terror. The pounding of my blood in my veins rings loud in my ears, drowning out the sounds of the voices outside the steel walls, or maybe the material of the walls is too thick to hear clearly. Pushing aside the panic that bubbles in my chest, I focus on my breathing. Measured breath in, slow exhale out. Growing up, my brothers liked to play hide and seek. As the smallest of us, I could wriggle into the best hiding spots, and yet my brothers never failed to find me. Until finally, Zine explained that the excited sound of my breathing gave me away. It took me practice on my part, but eventually my brothers needed to use more than just their ears to find me. When my breathing calms, I strain to hear what is happening with my team. The voices are muted. Mumbles tell me they are hard at work, but I cannot tell what the task is or how long it's going to take. Here and there, I make out a word. No, second law. Force. Wrong. In between the words are only silence and the pulsing of my heart marking the passing of seconds. Minutes. Maybe hours. Time stands still. During that time, I think of Thomas and I wonder what trial he is facing in his own induction. I wish he were here with me now to help me keep to help keep me safe. A whirring sound followed by a jubilant shout pulls me from my thoughts, but my prison door does not open. The voices outside are louder. I jump when something bangs against the box, but the lock stays firmly in place as my teammates continue to shout words that no matter how hard I try, I cannot understand. The voices go silent. To keep calm, I count the seconds. 10, 20, 60, 100. Still nothing, just darkness and silence. Did my team fail at their task and suffer a penalty, or did they succeed and choose to leave me behind? I close my eyes tight, clutch my bag to my chest, and continue to listen for signs that my team is still there, that I haven't been abandoned, that I will not suffocate in this metal coffin that I will not die here alone. The metal surrounding me vibrates. Over my quickening breath is the roar of a skimmer motor. Once again, I've trusted where trust was not warranted. Once again, I will suffer the consequences. I should stay calm. I should breathe carefully to conserve my air supply until I find a way out of here. Instead, I bang my head, I bang against the lid of my box and scream. The sound of the motor might drown out my cries, but I keep screaming on the chance that those leaving me behind can hear my voice. I want them to know that I am alive now, and if I die, I do so at their hands. My throat is raw. My hands ache when I stop my pounding. By now, my team is long gone. If I want to survive, I have to find a way out of here. I shift in the tight space so I can reach the fasteners on my bag. My fingers hunt through my belongings until they settle on the handle of my pocket knife. I click. A click of the flashlight bathes a small space with light. I struggle to shift positions in the tight space as I run the blade along the top of the bottom of the right side of the box, hoping to find a flaw in the design. When I find none, I roll to my left so I can reach the other side. So intent am I on my mission, I barely register when I hear something scrape against the outside of the box. I hear the sound again and hold my breath. Voices murmur. I knock three times on the lid, hoping someone will understand I'm trapped inside. I almost cry with relief when three knocks sound in return. Hang on, Sia, someone yells. We've almost got it. The sound of a latch sliding confirms the words. 
The metal above me shifts upward. I squint into the sunlight and see Will's and Enzo's faces peering down. Will's hands feel warm and strong in mine as he helps me stand and climb out. To my left, I see Jacoby and two other members of their team arguing. Their skimmer sits 20 feet beyond them. I heard the engine and thought you'd left. My voice is raspy from the screaming, evidence of my lack of trust. I would have thought the same thing. Will hands me the green team bag and glances over to a grove of trees growing near the fence about 50 feet away. Glaring at us from the center of the trees is Damon. If Damon had gotten his way, we would have hit the road right after getting the clue. He wasn't interested in wasting time on the second part to free you. It took a few minutes, but we helped him see the error of his ways. The darkening bruise on Will's cheeks give me an idea as how. You got it wrong, Jacoby yells at the girl next to him. Get out of the way and let me try. We should probably cut Damon loose to get out of here before they figure out the solution, Enzo says. I think we should leave him. A smile devoid of happiness crosses Will's face. Give him a taste of his own medicine. It's no less than he deserves. I look at the steel box where Damon would have left me to die, and my heart hardens. Will is right. Damon should understand what it feels like to be betrayed. Leaders, real leaders, must think of others before themselves. They need to. Consider the consequences of their actions and only sacrifice lives when it's needed to outweigh the needs of the few. And I realize, as much as I want to penalize Damon for his cowardly actions, I cannot. Not without performing the same act of, same kind of act I'm condemning Damon for. I am this team's leader. I will not leave someone I am in charge of behind. Damon is coming with us, I say, digging my pocket knife, uh, pocket knife out of my university bag. Get the skimmer ready. We'll be back in a minute. Without waiting for agreement, I walk toward the cluster of trees. The gray cast to the bark speaks of the lack of revitalization in this area. But the state of the trees and the other foliage, foliage does not hold my interest. Damon's reddened face and angry eyes do. He goes still as I approach and says nothing as I walk around him to examine the restraints Will and Enzo fashioned. His arms are wrapped around the tree behind him and bound to his wrists with strips of sturdy brown fabric, the same fabric that Damon's shirt is made of. Blood streaks his skin where it rubbed against the tree in efforts to get free. What do you want? Damon sneers. Are you going to pretend to leave me behind again? We both know you can't do it, can you? For a moment, my knife stills. The urge to leave him and his insults behind is overwhelming. To do so would almost certainly keep him from a leadership position. I could prevent him from making decisions that would affect me, my family, and my country. I have only to walk away and betray everything that I believe in. My knife slices through the restraints. Damon offers no thanks or shows of gratitude as he stalks toward the skimmer. The, angry I push, the anger I push aside returns. I take two steps and feel my foot catch. My knees and my hands jolt with pain as I hit the unforgiving ground. Tears caused by my stinging palms, my anger with Damon, and my disappointment in my own desire to punish him prick from the back of my eyes. I ache for home, for my family, for Thomas, for people who love me, for people I can trust in my life. But they are not here, and I need to get moving. I push to my knees and realize whatever tripped me is still wrapped around my left ankle. I reach down and find thin, pliable wire where I expected to find a vine or a root. Carefully, I unhook the metal from my ankle and examine it more closely. No rust, no wear, extending from where I sit to somewhere to my right. Sliding my fingers across the length of the wire, I follow it to its end, which is expertly secured around a small but sturdy bush. A snare, a simple one designed to catch an animal bounding through its grouping of trees. If an animal steps into or puts its head through the loop and keeps walking, the loop will tighten, as I did around my leg. The more the animal struggles, the more tightly it is trapped. Only instead of dinner, the snare caught me. Are you okay? I turn and see Enzo standing near a scraggly tree looking at me. I'm fine. I brush off my knees and glance around for signs of other snares. My foot just caught on something. There, sunlight glints over the silver metal, only this time to a snare is located on the other side of the fence. As I take a deep step toward the fence, Endo says, if we don't want the other team to pull ahead of us, we need to get going. 
Enzo has a point. Still, I step toward the fence. I just want to take a closer look at something. It'll only take a minute. See ya. Enzo's voice holds authority and whispers of nerves. There's nothing we need inside the Air Force base. We need to go back to the skimmer. Damon and Will won't wait around for us much longer. I look to the skimmer and see Will waving at us. Enzo is right. It is time for us to go. I cast one last look at the wire trap set on the other side of the fence before walking away. As we climb into the skimmer, I don't think I imagine the relief on Enzo's face or the tension that leeches from his shoulders. Being left behind is reason enough for worry, but does his concern indicate something more? The rise of the skimmer and the roar of the engine pull my thoughts away from what lies behind and refocus me on the task ahead. What did the last clue say, I ask? Enzo pulls a gray piece of paper from his pocket and hands it to me. The end is in sight. The next stop is near. In foundation of our commonwealth, you shall search. Look for the symbol of where you live and find what you seek upon its perch. The answer seems straightforward enough. The central government building, I say. That's what we thought, Will says, his eyes fixed firmly on the road. In the seat next to him, Damon sits with his arms crossed as he stares out the window. Saving him from the snake and choosing to keep our team intact were the right things to do. But by making those choices, it is clear I have also made an enemy. Then again, maybe he was always my enemy and I just didn't know it. Even after spending an entire day with Enzo and Damon, I know little more than I did before about their families or the values they've been raised on. With Damon, I can make a guess. His willingness to get ahead at the cost of others must have been a skill he learned from his government-connected father or the teachers who helped him prepare for the university. But Enzo is a mystery. From the way the others treat him, I can guess his family is not connected to the Tosu government. Who they are and what they believe in, I do not know. But the worry that sprang to his eyes when I made a move to examine the snares makes me determined to find out. By the confident way he directs Will through the scenery that changes from dirt to plants to roads, walkways and small buildings, it is clear Enzo grew up nearby. Through the smudge skimmer windows, I study the landscape. The buildings and the plant life surrounding the houses look well tended, more like the dwellings we create in Five Lakes than the other ones I've seen in the heart of the city. Children stop, play, stop their playing to wave as we drive past. Citizens on bicycles or the occasional motorized scooter steer down the streets as people hurry to whatever tasks await them. The number of personal skimmers filling the roadway increases as the buildings grow larger and less spread apart. Some stand five or six stories high. Books tell us taller buildings once graced the city streets, some reaching hundreds of feet into the air, but they were too tall, too exposed to survive against the trembling of earth and destructive winds. While the tallest buildings faltered during this final three stages of war, most structures in the city, while shaken and sometimes cracked, stood strong. Their smaller stature proved to be an asset, one of a country could rebuild upon. Will's face is a mask of concentration, and his hands tighten on the controls as the streets become more crowded. He speaks only to ask Enzo when he needs clarification about the direction he is going in. Finally, I see in the distance the river bank that signals our destination is near. The flowing river sparkles. A carpet of green, healthy grass frames the river on either side. So we just need to find a picture of a balanced scale, Will says, once he safely steers a skimmer into the vehicle zone and turns off the engine. Sounds easy enough. Easy? Damon shoots Will a withering look. Have you been inside the central government building? It'll take a miracle to find anything in there. I hate to think, but as we walk toward the central government building, I realize Damon's right. The United Commonwealth government was officially created a hundred years ago in a large structure that sits on the east bank of the river. Two stories tall with circular walls and a low domed roof, the building has a short but sturdy design that helped it survive the worst of the natural disasters with little more than a few broken windows. The lack of damage and the large rooms can accommodate thousands of people, made it an ideal site for the survivors of the war beginning to lay foundations for a new country. It is hard to imagine those first days when the earth quieted and people began to assess the damage. Corrupted rivers that caused illness or worse, destroyed homes and a ground too contaminated for plant many plants to grow, a world filled with sorrow and fear. Instead of pulling clothes to the doors 
and cowering in the dark, people gathered here to pool their resources and restore hope. I glance at the large square building on the land just north of the central government building, now named Tosu City Hospital and Medical Research Center. I don't know what it was called then, but it was used as a safe living space for those without homes or those too old, young, or terrified to be alone. An enclosed walkway allowed people to pass safely between the two structures without having to brave the chemical and radiation-laced elements. Leaders were elected, laws made, crews organized, and sent outside to evaluate the city. Canned food was gathered and rationed. The dead found inside were buried in a crevice opened by an earthquake on the west side of the city. A group was formed to scout around the city for signs of still living plants, animals, and people. Water was boiled and filtered. Even then, drinking the water made people sick, which prompted leaders to send the survival, surviving scientists to the uni university labs. The scientists used the equipment there to run tests on the river, hoping to discover a way to make it pure once again. One by one, buildings were repaired and deemed safe. Families left the safety of the living with their entire community and moved into their own dwellings. Scientists found plants like clover that th thrived in the damaged soil and began splicing their genes into less hardy vegetation. With hope, organization, and care, the world came alive again, and it all started here. People mill in the country courtyard or stand talking in small groups. A hundred feet from our position is a small flight of stairs that leads to the entrance of the beige stone building. On either side of a fountain is a tall silver pole. At the top of each is a flag, the red, white, and blue one from the past that will never be forgotten, and the other displaying a stark white background trimmed with purple. In the center of the field of white is a single crimson rose. White to symbolize hope and purity of purpose, purple for courage. The red petals of the flower signify the promise of the people determined to make the rose and the rest of the country thrive. I can't help but wonder how the testing was allowed to grow from that promise. Did those who conceived of and intend for the price of failure to be so high? How many people walking the halls of this building know the true nature of the testing? How many more have fiend deafness because they don't want to hear and recognize what by ignorance they condone? We walk up the steps and I glance over my shoulder to look for the other teams. None are in sight as we step into a room buzzing with activity. The antechamber is filled with people. Large white panels hanging from a two-story ceiling bask the room in light. On the wall to the right is a mural of the colonies and boundaries of the current United Commonwealth. Directly in front of us are two large sets of doors that lead to the debate chamber. Where do we start looking? Enzo asks. The observation gallery? The offices? Will frowns. See ya, I came here for orientation a couple months ago. I don't remember seeing anything with scales on it. Then again, we only went through about half the rooms in the building. We should split up, Damon suggests. I only have one thing. I only, I have only to think about Damon's desire to leave me locked in that box to reject his idea. We should stay together. Otherwise, we'll spend even more time trying to reconnect with one another. Damon gives me a flat stare. Fine, you're the captain. You tell us how we're going to get search hundreds of rooms and find the scales before the next team does. I don't know, I admit, but my desire to outthink Damon has me determined to find out. Our orientation leader said the building contained almost 200,000 square feet of offices, meeting rooms, and discussion chambers. Searching through them all could take days. We're wasting time. Can someone make a decision already? Or is this or is talking all they taught about taught you how to do in the colonies? Damon scowls at me and Will. Will glares back. At least they taught us something. The only reason you're here is because your father is a hotshot Commonwealth official. I bet he knows where the scale symbol is in this place. Too bad he isn't here to ask. Instead, we're stuck with you. Damon moves fast. Before I realize what's happening, he pushes Will back toward the wall behind us. I see shock register on Will's face a moment before he slams into the hard surface. Will grabs Damon's shoulders and shoves, sending Damon staggering back. I race in between the two, hoping to talk some sense into them before they get thrown out of the building or worse. Stop! I snap. 
trying to mimic the tone my mother uses on my brothers when they are fighting. Unless you're hoping to impress the government officials with your right hooks, I think we should find what we came here to do. After that, the two of you can beat each other senseless for all I care, okay? I wait for Will or Damon to object. Neither does. Good. I push my hair off my forehead and take a deep breath. Now, maybe we can get back to solving this task. Well, according to Will, we're not smart enough to figure it out on our own, Damon sneers. That's not what I said. This time, Enzo steps in and keeps the peace, and I let him because Will and Damon have given me an idea. The clue did not say we had to find the scales on our own. While Damon's father isn't here for us to ask, there are dozens, if not hundreds of government officials who work in this building every day. Some of them must know where the symbol of the scales of justice is. We just have to ask. I approach a lady sitting in a nearby room with a glass of uh, with a glass window. When she sees me looking in her directions, her lips curve into a sympathetic smile. Taking that as a positive sign, I leave the boys behind and walk over. The woman slides open a panel of the glass. Can I be of assistance? Her eyes shift behind me. She no doubt wonders if the help I need is with my unkept, ill-mannered companions. I'm hoping you know where I can find a picture or sign with a statue with balanced scales depicted on it. There's supposed to be one somewhere inside this building. With a nod, she says, if you go through those doors there, I believe you'll find a small rendering of that symbol on the back of the moderating justice's chair. She points to the double doors situated between the two maps, the doors that led into the debate chamber. Next to the door is a sign that lists the discussion and voting schedule for the day. I look down at the watch strapped to my bag. The debate chamber session is almost over. Once it ends, the chamber doors will be locked until the debate floor opens again at 9 o'clock in the morning. Unless we can convince someone to unlock the doors for us, we will have to wait and search the chamber during one of those session breaks tomorrow. Or will we? I think back to the second line of the clue. Look for the symbol of the house you now live in and find what you seek upon its perch. If an image of balanced scales is on a chair, then what we seek isn't going to be waiting for us when the chamber is empty. It's what it is at this very moment seated on the chair. The moderating justice, President Annaline L. Colander. So that was chapter eight from Independent Study by Joel Charbonneau.